Welcome to part four of Lechmere and the Whitechapel murders. In previous episodes i would covered the various attacks and murders that preceded the Autumn of Terror, then the first two canonical murders, those of Polly Nichols and Annie Chapman, and then I discussed the double event in episode three. I've shown how Lechmere had opportunity to kill or attack all of these victims. Now it is time to move on to the murder of Mary Jane Kelly, the most talked about uh, victim of Jack the Ripper. Uh, I've always found the particular obsession with Mary Jane Kelly over the other victims as a little bit odd, to tell you the truth. I guess this obsession dates back to the, to the Night Book, which got many people involved in Ripperology and the Royal Conspiracies, which all revolve around Mary Kelly. Uh, and the films, such as From Hell, tend to focus on her as the ultimate victim, with the others just being in some way ancillary. She was the last canonical murder, the last of the five, uh, and that leads some to assume that the other murders were, were about her in some way. Uh, or that as she was murdered in the most bestial way of all the victims, uh, that she was uh, in some way the ultimate and final crescendo in the Ripper's uh, campaign of terror. Uh, somewhat like a melodramatic horror crime novel, but that sort of thing only really happens in fiction. Of the five, Mary Jane Kelly is also the only one without a proper biography. Her family, her ancestry, her real background has baffled researchers even her true identity. Was Mary Jane Kelly even her real name? That being said, let's refer back to the uh, Scotland Yard file note that we've been looking at throughout this series. The attacks on Annie Millward and Ada Wilson don't feature on this list, but we've covered Emma Smith, Martha Tabram, Marianne Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and now, on the 9th of November, 1888, Mary Jeanette Kelly, as she's down here. Now, there's one interesting thing on this uh, memo, and that is the Times. But I'll point something interesting out here. For Emma Smith, it's got 12.15 and 5 a.m., 12.15 being what they presumed was the time she was attacked. 5 a.m. is when she got back to her lodging house and, and was seen by other people. Martha Tabram has got two times. 11.45 p.m., which was the last time she was seen by uh, Pearly Poll, which proves that they believed Pearly Poll, incidentally. And 5 50 a.m. when she was found dead on the stairwell at George Yard Buildings. Mary Ann Nichols, we've got 3.45 a.m. the time she was found, which was the time they presumed Charles Lechmere found her, 3.45. That shows they believed that Charles Lechmere found her at 3.45. Some people don't believe that the police believed that, but they did here, it's in black and white. Annie Chapman, she was found at 6am. Elizabeth Stride, 1am. Catherine Eddowes, 1.45, that 45 minute difference between the two. Catherine Eddowes, 1.45. Mary Jane Kelly, blank. And the reason why it's left blank, we'll come on to. I will start with some of the background details that can be established for Mary Kelly. And the first certain address we have for her is at Breezes Hill in 18, around 1886, on the corner with Pennington Street. Both Pennington Street and Breezes Hill are still there, but they've very much changed. The buildings were knocked down soon afterwards, and there's a big warehouse there. Actually, it's, the warehouse is showing on this map. It was knocked down very soon after these events. It is likely she was staying in a brothel uh, run by a guy called Stephen Maywood as the, primp, as the pimp. 
Seemingly, he was a career criminal and he had links to the Felix, Buki and Carty names that had been mentioned in connection with Mary Kelly. In 1887, a researcher working for Charles Booth as part of his famous survey of London actually visited uh, that area, Breezers Hill and Pennington Street, and found that one Breezers Hill and 79 Pennington Street, which were the corner properties uh, on, that, on that corner, were both actually brothels. Stephen Maywood lived at one Breezers Hill, at 79 Pennington Street lived a, guy, a man called Morganston, another name that crops up in connection with Mary Kelly, and a Mrs McCarthy also lived there, uh, who Mary Kelly was supposed to have stayed with. So this shows that there's a very close connection between Maywood and Mary Kelly. The property, 79 Pennington Street and 1 Breeze Hill, had been one building, a pub called the Red Lion. So again, those two corner properties were very closely linked. Furthermore, a few years later, Maywood and the Morganstons and Mrs McCarthy all relocated to a very small area in Limehouse around here, a few about a mile away from where they've been living with living all together and all next to each other on Breezes Hill and Pennington, Pennington Street. After leaving the brothels in Breezes Hill, she hooked up with a man called Joseph Barnett and after staying in several other locations ended up in a one-room flat in Miller's Court just off Dorset Street in Spitalfields. On the evening of the 8th of November, the night before the Lord's Mayor's Parade, she was seen drinking in various pubs in the area. For example, the Ten Bells, the Britannia, and various other locations around where she lived. She'd split up a few weeks before with uh, Joseph Barnett because she'd gone back to prostitution. And he uh, didn't agree with this, and uh, left. but she, he still visited her. Even that night, the night before the Lord Mayor's Parade, he went round and visited her for an, an hour or so. But later that night, one of the last people to see her, with any degree of certainty, was a man called George Hutchinson, who saw her outside a pub called the Queen's Head, which I've referred to in an earlier episode. It's on, and it's still there, it's not a pub, but it's on Commercial Street on this corner here, just down the road from the Ten Bells, which is also there. The Britannia is gone, the Ten Bells is there still, the Queen's Head, the building is still there, the Britannia is gone. Hutchinson saw her talking to a man in an astrakhan coat outside the Queen's Head and at 2am in the morning and followed her across the road, saw them go into her into her lodgings. Another interesting witness, I won't go through all the witnesses that supposedly saw her, but another interesting witness called Caroline Maxwell supposedly saw her at 8am next morning, maybe as late as 9.30am in the morning. But, but Caroline Maxwell's testimony is very much disputed. At 10.45am in the morning, which wasn't long, that long after the supposed sighting by Caroline Maxwell, uh, the landlord of the property where Mary Jane Kelly was staying, called uh, also called McCarthy, it's a coincidence with the other lady called McCarthy that I mentioned earlier, sent one of his men to collect a load of rent that Mary Kelly owed to the landlord. This man was called uh, Indian Harry or Thomas Bowyer. He knocked on the door, there was no answer. Eventually he looked through the window, there was a broken window with a uh, cloth stopping you looking through it. He looked through the window and saw to his horror the destroyed body of Mary Kelly lying on her bed. In shock he immediately went to Commercial Street Police Station which was just around the corner. There's some reason to think he may have actually sent a boy rather than going himself. Either way, the police were called very quickly. 
but the door wasn't opened. It wasn't knocked down actually until 1.30 p.m., you know, a couple of hours later. This is because the police were nervous about breaking in there, doing something wrong. They, were, they thought they had to send for some bloodhounds and dogs to search for the, uh, the scent of the supposed, you know, supposedly search for the scent of the, of the culprit to track him down. In this confusion, they, no one wanted to take the authority of breaking in until eventually they did at 1.30 when the superintendent of the division came and, and authorised it. Uh, that's why there's no time on the uh, on the list for her death because of this confusion, because they didn't know what time to put down basically for the discovery. They didn't actually break down the door until one thirty. Although Indian Harry Bowyer looked through at ten forty five and saw the body there, so they didn't know what time to put down on the list. That's basically the reason. Anyway, the body, as I said, was severely mutilated. The heart was missing. That's led to all sorts of, uh, of theories as well. But as with all Ripper murders, it was also investigated to see if it was a domestic. Barnett, who I've referred to, was questioned for four hours and he had an alibi. Hutchinson, who I mentioned, was also interrogated by Aveline, the senior, the senior detective on the ground investigating the case. Of the wounds that were committed to the body, some think that a sheet was placed over Mary Kelly's face and that she was stabbed through the sheet so the killer didn't have to look at her as he performed these grisly mutilations. There's an elaborate theory that he did this because he knew her and didn't want her to look at him. Similar theories lie behind the idea that the killer obtained entry by reaching through that broken pane of glass in the window that I mentioned and somehow opening the door or the fact that her clothes were found neatly folded on a chair. Uh, had she been, had she gone to sleep and been attacked in her sleep by an intruder familiar with her arrangements in that place or, or was she, someone familiar to her invited in and she was at, at her ease and comfortable and that's why she folded up her clothes. Uh, you know, w w it's it's a bit of a mystery, but there's all sorts of elaborate theories uh, to account for these things. Whatever might be the case, how is Lechmere linked to this murder, I hear you ask? Firstly, there's the likely time of death. The most accepted time is around 4am. I, I gave an indication that there are uh, potentially a very wide uh, time of death for Mary Kelly but the most considered opinion is it was probably about 4am which is about the same time as the other evening or night time early morning weekday murders workday murders and would neatly coincide with Lechmere's usual murder pattern. It was also as we can see by the, the, the sweat the stick neatly on the axis between Lechmere's house at uh, Dufton Street and his workplace at Pickford, with the likely place where he'd pick up Mary Kelly on Commercial Street here, if he picked her up in the street. But did the killer know Mary Kelly, Mary Jane Kelly? Well, here's an intriguing connection. I've been mentioning uh, the character of Stephen, the interesting character of Stephen Maywood several times already. Now, Stephen Maywood, when he lived at Breezes Hill, here. Yeah. He sent his kids to school, a uh, school called Lower Chapman Street School over here. And guess what? When Lechmere lived at James Street here, some of his kids went to the same school, Lower Chapman Street School, the same school that uh, Stephen Maywood sent his kids to. So the, the man who was Mary Kelly's probable pimp was a co-parent at the same school as Charles Lechmere. So there's a fair chance that they may even have known each other. So Charles Lechmere may well have known Stephen Maywood and by implication may well have known Mary Kelly, one of his prostitutes. There's another intriguing thing that Lechmere's daughter who was brought up and lived with his mother 
all her life, she was called Mary Jane. Was Mary Jane Kelly her real name? Did she assume those names? And was she influenced in that choice by Lechmere's daughter, who was also called Mary Jane, who had been born in 1875? She would have been about 10 or something like that when Mary Kelly moved into Breezes Hill. So there's a good case for believing that Mary Jane Kelly wasn't her real name, which is why efforts to trace her have bamboozled researchers. So did Mary Jane Kelly perhaps create a new identity for herself to put distance between her and her family and her previous West End contacts uh, where she used to work in that area before she moved to the East End? Is that why she perhaps gave herself a new identity when she moved to the East End? And did she just choose that name Mary Jane based on uh, the friends of his of her pimp's children it's a possibility now it's also interesting that Mary Jane Kelly was seemingly worried about the Ripper and was interested in newspaper stories uh, about the Ripper case so would she have taken someone she didn't trust or know into her flat would she, would she have allowed someone she didn't know? Would she have trusted them that well? Well, that's another intriguing aspect of the case. Anyway, I've given you the reasons how and why Lechmere killed Mary Jane Kelly. But that was not the conclusion of his work. There's this slightly ridiculous theory that the level of mutilation was the climax for the Ripper. And he could never replicate or better that uh, thrill that he got from those horrible mutilations that he carried out on Mary Kelly. Or alternatively, that he couldn't face committing another murder after that glut or that it destroyed his mind. But these theories actually don't work in the real world for serial killers. None operate in that way. So in conclusion, we have with Mary Kelly... Another murder on Lechmere's route to work on a work day at the time when he'd been going to work. Furthermore, we have this intriguing possible connection between Lechmere and Mary Kelly through the character of Stephen Maywood, her pimp through the school that Lechmere's children went to and Stephen Maywood's children went to. There's no other closer tangible connection between any other serious suspect and Mary Kelly. In the next episode, we'll look at the Ripper's continuing activities in the East End of London as he left a longer trail of blood across these streets.